Welcome to Hermes Press's 2021 Comic-Con at Home Memorial Panel for artist Frank Thorne. This is Dan Herman, publisher of Hermes Press, and we decided to present a number of interviews to memorialize and commemorate the career of Frank Thorne, perhaps the greatest advocate of erotic comic book storytelling. Just about everybody in the comic book world, and I mean the world, knows of Frank's creation, Gita of Alizar. Gita of Alizar was created um, in many respects in response to the work that he did on Red Sonia. He was dissatisfied with the manner in which Red Sonia was being drawn and wanted to present a mythical universe which was unrestrained as mainstream comic books were at the time. So he went out on his own, which was very unusual, and created Gita of Alizar, which initially appeared in 1984, a magazine from Warren Publications. He continued to do many, many Gita stories, and we have collected them all in one of our books, which, appropriately enough, is called Frank Thorne's Complete Gita of Alizar. Frank didn't stop there. Frank was an extremely versatile artist and writer. And it should be noted that with the artwork he did after he left Marvel uh, with Red Sonia, he penciled, inked, and lettered all of his artwork, did not use assistance. He, when color was required, he colored his own material. Now, Frank didn't stop with Gita. He worked on a number of projects known to many and not known as well to many, which would include Lawn, Ribbit, Danger Rangerette, uh, Moonshine McJugs, uh, and a host of other uh, strips and characters. He worked for Playboy magazine for 20 years and received uh, an award from the magazine for his accomplishments there. And he did cartoons for many, many different magazine magazines. He wrote novels and he did advertisements and he did just about everything you could possibly conceive by himself which put him in a very interesting category. And all of these things will be discussed through the panel we're going to present to commemorate Frank Thorne, who passed away just recently on March 7th, 2021. So without further ado, as you've been watching the images of Frank Thorne's work, let's get to the panelists. Now, due to time constraints and logistical issues, Instead of having everyone on a panel interacting, we decided to interview the panelists separately and then present each interview on its own. So, let's get to the panel. This is Dan Herman from Hermes Press, and we are doing the Frank Thorne panel, and uh, I am going to start talking to Brian Peck, who is a senior editor from Hermes Press and has been a senior editor uh, we were thinking for 500 years. Uh, we're not quite as old as the 2,000-year-old uh, man, Carl Reiner um, and uh, Mel Brooks, but we're close. So that being said, uh, Brian was responsible for bringing Frank Thorne to Hermes Press. And I wanted him to tell us how, first of all, he got interested in Frank Thorne in the first place and how that very important event happened where he was able to... Uh, get a hold of Frank and he'll tell us about that and how Frank started doing stuff with Hermes Press, so Gita, uh, Juan, Ribbit, um, and all that sort of thing. So go ahead, Brian, you can take it away. So uh, I first uh, got exposed to his artwork with uh, Red Sonia. Uh, growing up, a friend of mine's brother happened to have uh, pretty much most of the Red Sonia issues uh, that he had drawn. And of course, at the time, I couldn't pick them up because they weren't in 7-Eleven. And uh, I was hooked on his artwork, didn't realize who it was, because at the time, 
kids never really looked at who the artist was. We never knew who did it. No. And then a uh, few years later, um, there was a store that uh, I started going to called Eye of Agamotto. And this is one of the ones that had one that's of the- That's a great name. I, I, I was gonna say, that's a great name. I wonder who made that up. Could it be Steve Ditko? Uh, but go ahead, I'm sorry I interrupted. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, it was a great little store. It had a bunch of back issues. Uh, what it had the most was was uh, Warren Publications, Vampirella, Creepy Eerie, and then also a, an adult uh, magazine called 1984-1994. Let me and, ask you, behind you appears to be uh, a, a cover from 1994. Is that original art or is that just... Uh... Uh, well, Frank had done a pencil cover for one of, for one of the issues. For some reason, they decided not to use it, and they went with uh, an artist called Sam Julian, who painted a number of Vampirella covers. And just recently, uh, I had the pencils inked blue line, and the uh, artist is uh, David Roche. Uh, Zanuck also informed me that there was going to be an exhibit of Frank's work, and Frank was going to be at the exhibit. I'm, I live out on the West Coast, and so I never got a chance to meet Frank and I figured this might have been one of my few chances because he was known for not going to conventions uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so. So I flew back with my friend to New York and ended up uh, going to the exhibit. Uh, they had uh, a good range of his artwork besides his Red Sonia and Gita. He did um, uh, war comics for DC. He did some uh, horror covers. They have uh, did they have and any, also did Tomahawk. I was going to ask you, did they have any? Did they have any of his Dell stuff? Because he did the Twilight Zone, and he did uh, uh, hold any, any, and he did uh, you know Tom Corbett's Space Cadet. I, th I at, well back then they never gave back artwork, so this is all the artwork that he received himself. Okay. So um, I think probably the earliest was his Tomahawk work, which was probably either early seventies or late sixties. And um, th there was a very good crowd there. Frank was there and um, uh, Zanuck was there. Uh, they also had um, uh, Wendy Peeney who had worked with him, uh, or was an old friend of his in the 70s. Uh, and they even had a, uh, somebody dressed up as Red Sonia uh, cosplay. And uh, Frank uh, got a real kick out of that. Was he, was he wearing his wizard's hat? Uh, no, 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 he was... Uh, he, he was just, it was just, he was just Frank, okay. uh, but he was, he was really nice. So we got to talk to him a bit about some of his uh, works that he had, because he had some of them up on the wall. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was such a nice man. Uh, though one story uh, that, <laughs> it's a bit of a funny story, except for maybe the person who owned the artwork. <laughs> some people that were purchasing they had purchased the artwork. A lot of the stuff that was up on the walls was purchased and they were gonna be sent to the um, owners after the exhibit closed. There was one piece, I believe it was Marvel Fanfare 2, where Red Sonia is on this horse. And the original set in front of Frank and you know, usually artists will go and sign it. Well, he pull, pulled out a big red magic marker and signed Thorn right across the, the front of it. I must have been uh, that must have made you unreal. My, myself, uh, uh, another collector, Gene. There's probably about four of us standing there. We almost had heart attacks because we could not believe it. And we walked up to to Z Zadik was not there. He was someplace else. We walked up to Zadik and said, uh, "We've decided that we don't want Frank to sign our artwork." <laughs> but it didn't seem to bother him. He just signed it. I mean. And for most artists, they look at it as, hey, this is a process. I've drawn it years ago, no attachment to it. The guy who was standing there, who who had the, the page, uh, the cover they had him sell, uh, sign, didn't seem to have phased at all. But we're thinking that he might have been a representative for the owner. Oh. And so he made, uh, we've never heard anything uh, from the owner or what's happened afterwards, but uh, it was a shocker, to say the least. How did how did you um, how, how, what did you what did you say to him? That, that I didn't say. I walked up to Zadik and and kind of mentioned it, and so that 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 was it. Um, but later he did talk to Frank, and 
and told them that yeah sign outside the artwork and so and and I and I've worked with other artists with other projects and known other artists uh, but I've never known one that when we were working on the Gita book the artist editions um, his uh, battling beauties or or the or reprinting his Gita or Lan the fee, the fantastic feedback we got from Frank he was a he was a dream to work with and he loved everything that we did um and that and he he was always sending very nice thank you emails uh when he would receive the uh published um uh pieces that uh, books that we had done let me introduce you uh oh. for the purposes of introduction this is howard davis and howard davis was i think it's fair to say a very good friend of frank thorns for many many years and, and we'll get into that and he was instrumental in uh, the book that we published called Battling Beauties, where he did extensive interviews with Frank. And I don't think there's a better person uh, to talk about Frank uh, than, than you, because I think you knew him for a long time and you're extremely familiar with his work. So that being said, please go on. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, that's quite all right. Uh, yeah, I, got, I, I was looking at this and I, there was four critical date, dates in uh, Frank's life. And uh, in a way, they frame it all. Number one was the Sonia Con, which was in November of 1976. And that was where he started to make such a huge splash with the fans. The other one that I, I focused on was uh, 2006. Let me, let me stop you. Did, did you go to the Sonia Con? I organized the Sonia Con. Okay, well then you did go. So, um, yeah, Wendy, obviously. Wendy, Wendy Penny was a Red Sonia, right or wrong? Oh yeah, that was the first convention which featured one character. Well, I mean, tell us about it. I mean, it must've been really neat. I mean, because conventions were in their infancy. The first comic book convention, I think, was in, was in New York in 1964. I'm pretty sure of that. And yeah, wait, uh, well, we we formed a group down in South Jersey and we said we'd like we think we can do a Philadelphia area convention and the Philadelphia area convention uh, we thought would be in Philadelphia and then we looked at venues and found out South Jersey was probably more convenient for everybody and we picked a hotel right near the turnpike and everything came together pretty well there were actually six of us that were the the organizers of the convention and the convention was, uh, or our group was called the Delaware Valley uh, Comic Consortium. Uh, and, you know, I could give you the names of the other five people, but it's really not germane. And we honored uh, Frank for his artwork and Roy Thomas for the scripting. And they were our two special guests and we had uh, sold tickets and all like that. It's, it goes down kind of in history as, as an important convention and people who were there talk about how great it was, but we only had an attendance of 750. Only? Which was, was, that was uh, a lot. Not, huh? I mean, that, that, that was a lot of people in 1973 for a comic convention. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe so, but not for a New York one. All of us who were part of the uh, Delaware Valley group had been to New York conventions and saw how they were run and what they did and all like this. And we did, we did basically the, uh, the same sort of thing with one great exception. Instead of having a comic costume parade, we had Red Sonia's. And there were six young women, I believe was the number, that uh, put on a Sonia costume and paraded. And I don't remember whether one of them got a prize for being the best Sonia or not. I was, I was pictures? specific. Do you have, do you have, what's that? Do you have pictures? Pictures. I mean, because we, we can put them in, you know, and, and show I them. don't think so. Oh, okay. What's well, too I bad? I don't think so. It, it was, it uh, let me explain one thing. We, the six of us busted up our uh, work in the convention, and uh, Rich Green was the one who was in charge of publicity and all like that. 
and he would have got pictures if anybody did, but I don't think I've ever seen him if he got them. Uh, I was in charge of the dealer's room and getting that set up. And, you know, there were a lot of things that went on at the convention that I didn't see. For instance, my son, who was then 11 years old, managed to hang out in the room where the Sonias were getting dressed. Lucky boy. And, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And he kind of squatted down, sat on the low while uh, on the floor while the, the, the girls were parading by and all like this. And he's telling me afterwards what they didn't wear underneath their costumes. And <laughs> it was apparently nothing. Uh, I did not see Frank presenting the six women. I did not see the six women parading. Uh, I was busy in, in taking care of the dealers and the dealers rooms and all like that. Uh, the, the main thing was that there was just a very, very huge fan response to what was going on. And that was the thing that that moved him into a next stage of his life where he would go to con various conventions and portray the wizard. Yeah, so I was gonna ask, was he, or was he, he wasn't dressed as the wizard at the first time you got No, okay. no, he didn't have the wizard costume until later. Uh, you know, it, which culminated, of course, in 1981 with the Sonya show that he put on in San Diego. But he, he, uh, he loved it. Well, one thing, I think is a footnote here in what we're talking about. Frank was very, very, very reluctant to use the word artist to refer to himself. He once said to me, he says, I, I said, you're, you're a real artist in this particular thing. And he took that, he says, he took that as a compliment. And he said that he believed that the word artist applied to a person was appropriate for someone else saying it to him about him. It was not appropriate for he himself to call himself an artist. And what he preferred to think of himself as was an entertainer. And when you think of yourself as an entertainer, then what he did in the, with the Wizard and Sonia shows was uh, just big part of, of being that. So that was the first date that I picked out, which was worth talking about. The second date, which, com which comes up much later, is the uh, Comics Journal issue number 280, which put down the interview uh, from 2006 that Gary Groth had with, uh, with Frank at, at great lengths. And the reason I select that as important, Frank wanted to, be wanted to be considered a master of every field, kind of field that he touched upon in his career. And he purposely tried to touch upon every, every, every part of what his work could be. And the, interview that was done for TCJ basically noted that he had come to the top of the field in every area. The latest, the last one that he came into, of course, was humor cartooning. And uh, it was, he in that he was, was uh, awarded uh, an, an annual best award uh, by Playboy Right, for right, his right. for his moonshine, yeah, right. yeah. For, yeah and exactly. That, that was decidedly uh, his recognition that he had come to the point where he was abs an absolute master in everything. And when I say everything, I'm talking about everything. He did not only the porn issue, the big porn issue, which was uh, Devil's Angel number three. He also did Sunday school supplement uh, brochures for churches. Well, he, he, you're right. He had a very wide range. I mean, he did Tomahawk for DC. He did the Twilight Zone for Dell. He did strips. You know, he did the Perry Mason strip when he was, you know, when I guess in his 20s, I think. Was in his oh, yeah. 20s. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Well, he, you know, he, he got his career kind of backwards because most, most of the uh, artists aspired to be a syndicated artist. He started out as a syndicated I artist. I mean, that was, that, was, that was the great ambition of every comic book artist was to be a strip artist because as Frank was, they were all influenced by Hal Foster and Alex Raymond, uh, Kniff, uh, I mean, you know, uh, Frank Robbins, I mean, you know, all the, you know, and Noel Sickles. Um, and, you know, that was kind of what you aspired to be was a strip artist. And, 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 it, was, and, and, and it was a steady gig. So you got paid all the time. I think one of the saddest things in recording uh, Frank's career is the fact that we cannot reprint his Guy Bennett series. And the reason we can't is because over the years, when somebody asked him for a piece of his artwork, he reached in and pulled out a strip and gave it to him. And there are very, 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 very few uh, sequences that are not missing one or two strips to make a, a total uh, storytelling from the strip. But uh, if you look at the, the latest, when you, you're gonna have trouble looking at it because nobody's been able to reprint it. The last year that he did the Guy Bennett strip, there is nobody, nobody that I know of who did better brushwork and better line work to get across the character and the, the, this, the way it's handled. Just magnificent line work. Now that did, that did not immediately carry over into his comic book work where there was color. But far as the black and white work goes, it was magnificent. But the, the color and the fact that its comic books are reproduced with a, a, a fairly, you know, a bit with a 60 line screen. You're, and of course it was reduced significantly in size to fit the comic book. And then as you point out, then it's colored. It loses a significant amount of the character of the drawing. Um, and which is why to see original artwork is so phenomenal because you see everything that's lost. Fellow with everybody that he talked to and he got himself into some jam situations uh, occasionally because of that, but it, it wasn't really of his own making. How did you, how did, well, okay, so we know you first met him. How, so you, how many years did you know him? I mean, more or I, less. I, I first met him face to face in November of 74. I had decided to uh, collect original art and I made myself a list of my favorite artists. And I knew that per how I get paid as a, as a collector, right? I knew that by going and interviewing the guys and then getting the interview published that I could end up with an original. <laughs> So I was very self-serving in that. And uh, Rich Green, a co-collector, and I and my son, we went off on a November, I think it was five day holiday. I don't think it was a full week even, but we scheduled to visit uh, Frank Thorne, Murphy Anderson, Everett Raymond Kinsler, Fred Fredericks, and Howie Chaikin. Well, you picked a good group, and well, uh, I see that I was picking all my favorites. Well, and you picked a good group. Of, and second, that was that was the first. Now, the reason we went to see Frank Thorne in '74 was because I had de identified his work on Tomahawk and Hunter's Hellcats as being absolutely superb, and that was what I wanted to talk to him about at that particular time. Uh, you know, it, Sonia came up later. And then, as I say, our group agreed that Sonia was so worthy of note that we wanted to have a convention specifically dedicated to her. And that's what we had. Now, uh, you know, going on with my, my significant dates, uh, you know, this, this 2006 interview showed all of the things that Frank had done with the exception of the advertising art and things like the Sunday school supplements and so on and so forth. But 
it basically showed that he was a master at that time of every one of those things that he put his hand to. And he, he, you must remember also that he was basically a solo act. Very few, very, very, very few have that particular distinction. In the early days, he didn't necessarily do the writing, but by the time we get to Gita and beyond that, he's doing all the writing, he's doing all the penciling, He's doing all the lettering. He's doing all the coloring, if there was coloring involved. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, as he said at one time to me, he says, look, he says, uh, I don't, I, I put this out there and I take the blame for whether people like it or don't like it because it's all mine, you know. I want to get back to the two dates that uh, shape his life. And, the next one that I got here is December 2012, and that is when his career for producing stuff for, for publication actually ended, because that's when his eye trouble got to the point where he could not draw fine stuff anymore. He was, he was faced with the idea of giving up his Playboy work, giving up couldn't do comic books at all. And he shifted to going to uh, the paintings at that particular point. But it, it, was a, it was a real crash in his life because it came on him rather suddenly. And uh, that becomes a very clear marker in his life. And the fourth marker, the last marker, is when his son died in uh, December of 19, 2019. And at that particular point, he was placed into, into such a deep depression that he never, as far as I know, drew anything from 2019 on. I had seen him in November of 19, and it was, I thought it might be the last time I was gonna see him because my eyesight is also failing and they're threatening to take my driver's license away if it gets any better. So I figured I better get up there and see him at least one more time, which I did in November of 19. And at that particular time, he showed me what he had painted, what he had on the boards and all like this. And he was uh, in the process of, of doing one and it was on his desk, it was half finished. And he said to me, he says, I am having so much fun doing this. I just love doing this. And it wasn't selling. I don't know whether it'll ever sell because it's a page art that's really in demand. But right. here he is, you know, seven years after he can't do what he, he basically did most of his life. And He's saying it is just so much fun. He'll continue, continue. And then along comes December of 19. Right. And it is such a stressor in terms of his life that he never does anything further as far as I know. Comic-Con fans, this is a continuation of our Frank Thorne Memorial panel. Uh, we're going to talk to Gary Groth, who is the president of Fanographics and the editor of a Comics Journal, uh, who had a significant amount of involvement with Frank Thorne over the years from 1990 to 1991. Eros Comics, which was an imprint of Fanographics, published six issues of the erotic worlds of Frank Thorne, which included virtually all of his important characters. In fact, they even had in one of the issues, the last Gita of Alizar story. Uh, they published Lawn. Uh, they published uh, Moonshine McJugs. They published Ga uh, Danger Rangerette, uh, to mention just a few. And it uh, was very comprehensive of Frank's work. And then in uh, 2007, uh, in the Comics Journal, there was a very lengthy uh, interview, uh, which Gary conducted, which concluded by Frank mentioning all of the comic artists 
who had been married numerous times and he professed love for his life and said he'd only been married once and that when, when you find the right person, that's all you need. And that's the way the interview ended, which I thought was quite appropriate. So Gary, Frank's own guy. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you know, your interaction and involvement with Frank Thorne and, you know, why you think he stands out amongst all of the various artists during the 70s, 80s, 90s, and up until the 2000s. I think my first, uh, the first time I, I got a hold of Frank was in 1990. We were, we had just launched, or we were about, we were going to launch the Arrows Comics imprint. And the reason we were doing that is because uh, we were, uh, not for the first time, we found ourselves on financial, on shaky financial ground. And I came up with the bright idea of starting the Eros imprint and publishing um, x comics. And at that time, there were very few truly X-rated comics. There were underground comics, there were remnants of underground comics, but there were very few of what you might call X-rated pornographic comics. And so we were, and, and so we didn't know who could produce these comics, and we didn't know if anyone wanted to produce these comics. Uh, but uh, I think I, I I knew that Frank had produced, you know, maybe not pornographic comics, but at least sexy comics. And we call we call them erotic comics. Erotic, yeah. Well, we 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 called them smut. <laughs> same same thing, just a nicer word for it. Um. So one, of the, so one of the things we did when we started the Eros imprint was we contacted Frank. And I think I pitched the idea of publishing these comics in a, in a, in a comic series. It was called The Erotic Worlds of Frank Thorne, if I remember correctly. That's right. And I suggested that umbrella title so we would brand it with his name. And then I told him we could publish all the smut he'd ever done. Uh, you know, in this comic series, and kind of collect it all and, and put it all out. And there was a lot of it, and there was there was there was a good amount of it. We wanted all we could get, and uh, and I think you know, my recollection is that Frank was um, was all was in favor of it. He was all for it, um, and he more or less, you know, told us what he had, and I think he helped us arrange it into comic book format. Uh, break it down into the into specific comics. I think we published six issues, if That's I remember correct. correctly. That's you correct. might know this better than I do. And so we started publishing The Erotic Worlds of Frank Thorne sometime in 1990, I believe. And we probably published them every two months, um, if not more frequently, because all the work had already been done. It seems to me from dealing with him that he was pretty self-deprecating and had a pretty good sense of humor about himself and what he was doing. In fact, he always used to say, um, uh, Gil Kane always used to say that he was a comic book storyteller. So I asked him, are you a comic book storyteller? He said, no, no, I'm an entertainer. Uh, did he ever talk to you about that in that vein? No, he didn't. Um, I mean, not specifically being an entertainer, uh, I mean, I can tell you, he was great to work with. He was he was easy to work with. Um, you know, he never he never allowed his ego to get in the way of anything. Um, I think he he understood the value of his work and he understood his place. Um, you know, in 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 comics, and um, he was a real professional. You know, he started work. You probably know this. You know, you probably know his career better than I did, but I think he started maybe in the late 40s. That's correct. Um, and, he, and, you know, and he was a journeyman professional, and that's how he grew up into the industry. And I was thinking about this just a few minutes before we jumped on the call, and you know, and, and for, you know, since whatever, 1948, 1949, whatever he started in comics until he started doing, um, uh, you know, the um, Red Sonja stuff. Sonja, yeah. And that would have been, that would have been in the 80s. 
No, it was in it was 1975, and then no, uh, that early. it was a Marvel premiere, premiere, and it came out. It, it started in 75, and then you know you never know what the release dates, but the release date was 76, so it came out late 75, early 76. Right, right. Um, but you know he was essentially a journeyman cartoonist who worked for mainstream comics, and he did, and and he was a he was a good craftsman, but he was. You, you know, he was unexceptional. He was just an excellent craftsman. Uh, I mean, I remember reading his Tomahawks when I was a kid. Um, yeah, in DC Comics, everybody, every, actually, a yeah. lot of people were exposed to Frank Thorne, not through the stuff he did uh, with Dell, which was not particularly interesting, but through Tomahawk in DC. Tomahawk, and he, and he did a great job. Um, you know, his work always resembled uh, Joe Kubert's to some extent back then. And, but, but here's what I was thinking of is that he's one of the very few artists who worked in mainstream comics, who had an established career in mainstream comics and who broke out of mainstream comics and did work successfully on his terms. If you were to sum up Frank in his work, and I think, uh, the use of the word, I like to use the word journeyman, and it's not a derogatory term in my uh, estimation. It's somebody who's competent at what they do, but they're not brilliant. And they're most certainly not greatly inspired so that you look at it and you're swept away. You know, like, for instance, Alex Toth, or you mentioned Joe Kubert, who was uh, enormously talented, you know, you know, and, and you have all these other people who are fine, and they do a good job, and they know how to tell stories. But Frank, I think, distinguished himself because he did it, you know, like Frank Sinatra would say, he did it my, he did it his way. But, you know, how would you summarize your, um, I don't know, feelings about the stuff that you did in his career? Because you have a pretty good, I'm giving a grasp of it because you yeah. were involved in a lot of it. Well, he was, he was a journeyman cartoonist until uh, he became an independent cartoonist. And then he indulged his, his passion he did exactly what he wanted to do, and you could see it. I mean, you, you could you could see that he was personally invested in that work. Um, our next guest is Zadik Longenbach, who for many years was uh, Frank's art dealer, and interacted with him and knew him very well. And uh, so, let me ask you right off the top, Zadik, how is it that you became his art dealer? Well, I've been a uh corresponding with Frank for years as a fan uh, and collector about some of his works. And he kind of brushed it off. You know, I'm not really selling anything, but I have everything sitting here. And uh, <clears throat> one day he contacted me about a line decker painting he had. He had a Saturday Evening Post 1922 line decker cover painting that he was interested in selling. That sounds and, pretty like, impressive, actually. That sounds pretty yeah. impressive. It, it was, it was a, you know, a great little painting of a, a large woman blowing up uh, air rings, you know, little flotation devices, right. kind of a humorous piece of his. Um, and he actually got it. He traded many years ago. I uh, traded a puppy for it. <laughs> I guess he <laughs> got by his home, saw this dog. He's like, oh, that's a great dog. Would you trade a line decker painting for it? And he was like, yeah, sure, OK. And he had it for decades. Um, so I helped him sell that. And uh, then I spoke to him maybe uh, about doing something with all his works. I suggested doing it, you know, I was working with Illustration House and suggested a retrospective where we could offer for the first time his, uh, some of his pieces and he was- no, no, let, let me ask this, my understanding is that of course, the stuff that he did in the forties and the fifties was, you know, work for hire and the yep. stuff he did for Western Publishing slash Dell, they, they kept it. And he did strips and he had, he probably had a lot of the strips that he did. But, and of course, Marvel would return some of the work to the artists. Uh, but when he started doing his own stuff after he left Marvel and started doing Gita, my understanding was he kept everything. Is that right? He did. And I think when he was working at Marvel, since he was doing really everything, he was, he was the penciler, the inker, the letterer, the colorist. I think because of that, he retained all of his artwork too. So, you know, he really had almost everything. 
there were a, a few pages here and there they're missing they were probably the writer's share um, right yeah yeah roy thomas was yeah roy thomas who's the writer would have gotten i think one page or something one or two pages from each book but everything that other than that he pretty much had um and yeah he had all his own stuff he was he was good friends with joe kubert and um they decided, you know, they were very good friends, very close. And they decided that if we, know it, if we don't need to sell it, let's just not sell it. So they had no reason to sell it. So it just kind of all sat in a uh, file cabinet, stacked up his works, Marvel works, everything. So he, he really had everything. So it was easy to do that retrospective. He didn't have any of the daily stuff. That's those, those he didn't really have, but everything from Marvel, Gita, Ribbit, land all that stuff and, yeah. right yeah all, all the stuff that he did yeah uh, when he, he worked for he was doing stuff for eras he did six issues of eras he would have had a lot of that did he have the uh did playboy return the moonshine mcjugs uh stuff to him he had some of those not a, a small amount of the moonshines the uh danger angelettes the that kind of stuff but it, it was a small group of that that he also had uh, enough, he also and, and let me ask you about this, just so the audience knows. Yeah. Uh, you know, he did cartoons for a number of, of publications. I'm, I understand he did them for the New Yorker, too. I, he didn't have any of that stuff. Um, no. We never really talked about those things. You know, we talked about some of his projects, but, you know, I know he did some stuff for a uh, Bell Telephone in New Jersey. But yeah, he did, he, he did advertising artwork, too. And yeah, he, he didn't have any of that. And the other thing is, is that um, he did a lot of comps and uh, pitches that were not used. He would have gotten that back. Did, did you ever see any of that stuff? No, you know, like like some artists, um, every now and then I'd see a uh, one one time when I was you know I was visiting in his garbage can. He had a bunch of uh, Red Sonia sketch pages. You know, and he was kind of like, there was, I guess he was cleaning up because I was coming over, going through some stuff, and he just threw it all in the garbage, you know? So as, you know, sometimes artists don't realize that those things are of interest to people. And I was like, so I saw this pile of sketches. I was like, can I, can I have these, Frank? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, you can have those, you know? So I don't think he retained them. I don't think he kept them. I don't think he thought of them as anything. Uh, so he uh, probably- how, how, them. How, many, how many years did you work as his dealer anyway? Um, well, I, I started the retrospective and that was 2015. So uh, five, five years. That's the, that's the retrospective in, in, a, in another one of these uh, uh, interviews. I interviewed Brian Peck, who's a uh, special projects editor for Hermes Press. And he yep. went to that one. Did, yeah, did, did, anything, did anything happen that was kind of amusing or funny or you know, that's kind of memorable at that retrospective? Well, I, I, I missed it, but yeah, he had the, uh, supposedly somebody came up with the Marvel feature two cover and asked Frank to sign it. Um, and he, I didn't see it, but he said, they said he boldly signed it across, across the image. Um, and they were shocked by that because, you know, collecting yeah. our work, it's the image is everything. And Thank you for attending the San Diego Comic-Con International 2021 Hermes Press Frank Thorne Memorial Panel. Thank you to all the special guests that appeared and um, especially thank you to everybody that watched and listened. Have a good time and hopefully we'll see you in person next year. Bye-bye.